show. Uh, and she, she writes for uh, TV Guide, amongst other things. Kate Hahn. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the WGA Outlander panel. <laughs> Amazing writers, and we're going to start with Ronald D. Moore, who developed the show. And, um, you know, it has uh, won People's Choice Awards, Critics' Choice Awards, it's had three Golden Globe nominations. I mean, it's popular with viewers and critics. But we're not really surprised because it's under the guidance of Ronald D. Moore. Who <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, all of us in this room probably knew best before Outlander as the showrunner and executive producer of the fabulous Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> Uh, with Star Trek's The Next Generation. Uh, he's also worked on Star Trek Deep Space Nine. He was the showrunner and executive producer on Carnival and, and many other shows. So, um, Ron, I'm going to start with you. Outlander was a huge best-selling novel uh, written by Diana Gabaldon, yeah. international bestseller. Um, why this book and what made this book right for a television series adaptation? Uh, well, when I read the first novel, uh, I was reading it, you know, looking at it as a piece of material to adapt. So that was that was my first impression of it, and I just remember reading it and feeling like the central character of Clara was fascinating to me. I really liked her voice, I liked her intelligence, her strength of character, and then I was very taken by Diana's sort of um, uh, authenticity to the period, how much research she had done into Scotland and history and you know the social mores of the time. And then it was just a great page turner. I mean, there just kept being all these sort of twists of, of uh, fate and you know reversals of fortune as you went through the book. And in my mind, I just kept imagining, okay, yeah, that's kind of an episode, or I can see how this story is going to arc. And by the time I got to the end, I just said, yeah, this is a TV series. I, I can totally see season one. And you know, then I went on and read the other books later. But just from the first book, I thought, yeah, this is not your usual TV show. It's uh, an unusual tale. It's a traveling show. It keeps you know introducing characters and then you know losing them, changing uh, places, moving through time. Um, it, it just seemed like a unique property that I hadn't seen on TV before. It's quite unique, and when you're going to staff a writer's room for a show like this, you need to bring in people who each has a different kind of strength. And I'd love us for you to go down the line and kind of tell us why you brought each of these writers into the room, and we'll start with Tony. <laughs> Starting with those who paid me the most. <laughs> now, Tony and I go way back. Tony and I, uh, I worked with Tony Graffia. I don't even know how many years. I don't want to count. Because uh, we first worked together on a show called Roswell. <laughs> and, uh, Carnival, and then Battlestar Galactica. And Tony's just one of my favorite writers. I mean, she's she has chops, you know. She's one of those writers where... You always know the first draft's going to come in and it's going to be really well realized. It's going to have great dialogue, it's going to have a great sense of structure and, and passion to it. So whenever, literally whenever I think of a project, Tony's one of the first names that, that come up, comes up. <laughs> and the 10%. <Yeah. laughs> and what about this gentleman here, Matt? Matt and I, you know, go back to Caprica and sort of, you know, that experience, and then we developed a couple of pilots together and pitched, and uh, we went out on, on tour with a rock and roll band once, which was an experience. We spent time on the tour bus. Oh my God! Uh, so I've, I've known Matt to anybody, trust me. Yeah. Uh, and I just really like the way his mind works, and it was fun. And uh, you know, when you write a pilot with with somebody, when you write. Uh, 
in, in any kind of a writing partnership, as those of you who know who write in a partnership, it is like a little mini marriage. And you get to know each other real fast. And uh, Matt and I just really got along. We had very similar story sets, and it was just a fun collaboration. So it was, he was kind of a natural. And he knew the books. He was like, as I set up the room, it was like fans and non-fans. And Matt was someone who knew the books from way back. And it was, in many ways, the project kind of starts with Matt, because Matt introduced it to Meryl, and then my wife Terry also knew the books, and it was sort of from that sort of collaboration of the three of them that the books kind of came to my attention. And in case you guys don't know, Meryl is an executive producer, and Terry Dresbach, uh, Ron's wife, is a costume designer. <laughs> About the fabulous Anne. How 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 did you know Anne? <laughs> oh, she got <laughs> Because she was the fabulous Anne Kenny. It was just sort of. Uh, I knew Anne through Matt. Matt and Anne had worked together on a show, and then there was a project that uh, she had that uh, the three of us took out. It was a, a, a TV series about EMTs. And it was sort of a fun process of working through, you know, uh, developing that and taking it out and pitching. And she just had, she was fun in the room, just great story sense and strong. And, you know, it seemed like, again, it was a, a very natural fit. Okay. So I like the way you said you balanced out your, your staff with people who read the books and people who hadn't read the books. Why did you want to mix it up like that? Uh, I kind of felt, I mean, I'd never done a, a, an adaptation before, and I sort of felt that the biggest question in the room day to day was going to be what do you keep and what do you change? And that I'm serving two audiences simultaneously. There's the audience that knows the books, loves the books, you know, is looking forward to all the particular things that they're uh, uh, you know, in love with. And then there's the general audience that doesn't know anything about the books. And you sort of had to serve both at the same time. So the best way to figure out day to day and week to week how to develop the show was to have a room that was balanced in that same way. So that you know, over and over again, the argument in the room is, what do you change and why? And is it worth changing or not? And what are you losing? What are you gaining? Well, this is my favorite beat, or I always love that character. Yeah, but that doesn't make any sense to me. And do you really need that? And you need to have that sort of active argument in the room so that I could sit back and kind of listen to it and kind of figure out, all right, what is the right course of action here? So I think having a balance of those two opinions in the room every day was really one of the keys to our success. Well, I, I'm going to talk to each of you about a particular episode that you wrote. And so, Ron, I just want to start with the, the pilot. And a pilot, uh, I think a lot of the writers in this room know how hard it is to write a pilot. You have to set up a world, you have to set up stakes, you have to set up characters. Um, and you're also dealing with a lot of things that are tough as far as screenwriting you're, you're dealing with. Uh, first person narrative in the books that had to become a voiceover. So tell me what you wanted to achieve in the pilot and sort of how you set up that world of Outlander. Uh, it was kind of clear from my first reading of the book what the pilot kind of would be. You know, you had to set up the concept of the show. And the concept of the show is a woman from 1945, a ex-Royal Army combat nurse who's, who, you know, falls through the stones on her second honeymoon with her husband, ends up in Scotland and meets a young Scotsman that then is going to become you know, her soulmate. That's the fundamental logline of the show. So that had to be accomplished in the pilot. Uh, it was ironic in that the show itself wasn't entirely set up, even with that description, because it's not really until you get to the second episode of the season that you've introduced the larger sort of world of Scotland. You've met you know, the people at Castle Lick and the clans and start to really understand what the task is before her. But I sort of felt like I saw that story in the book. It was laid out slightly differently. Uh, I definitely collapsed time. You know, in the book, I think the events in the pilot take place over several weeks. You know, they're in the Highlands for an extended period of time. Claire has various meetings with people, and there are other characters that were established in Inverness that we didn't play in the, in the show. But I kind of felt intuitively that by telescoping the events into a couple of days, of Claire and Frank's, you know, uh, adventure in the Highlands, that I could kind of get to the story, and the story really begins once she goes through the stones. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Something that has been remarked upon about the show a lot is how hot and sexy it is. Um, yeah. Claire and Jamie are very hot and sexy together, and something that really built up in the first season was their attraction to each other. And, you know, people kept saying, why are they getting together? Why are they getting together? And finally, I think it was the sixth episode of Seven. 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 <laughs> you guys counted it down. Oh, you're you are not the counting for counting reasons, though. So, Anne Kenny wrote the episode, The Wedding. And <laughs> together, and um, critics loved this episode for its depiction of female sexuality and, and for so many other reasons. And I wanted you to talk about, how do you write a great sex scene? There you go. <laughs> um, well, first you start with Diana Gavilon's novels, which are full of great sex scenes. <laughs> I think that one of the things we wanted to do with the wedding episode was that we, I, I think overall in the series, the sex needs to mean something other than just sex. Otherwise, it just becomes kind of, you know, um, yeah, yeah, just kind of. Bow, chicka, bow, bow. Exactly. <laughs> so in the wedding episode, we wanted the, their, to see their relationship move forward. So the first time they have sex, it's just kind of awkward and, um, you know, look like first time sex. And then the second time, we used to talk about it in the room as, oh, this looks like fun. This is like a car. Let's take it for a test drive. Let's kind of see how this is going to work. Mm -hmm. And then the third time was... We did, we did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we did talk about that. I think, unless maybe I was just thinking about Ron it. Ron and I did not. Yeah. <laughs> I actually think that Talking was... about a beautiful statue, <laughs> artwork. We never say car. I actually think that was Ron Moore who said that. Yeah, and, and then the third time was going to be what we called love sex. Save you. Which was that it was about something more than that. So I think that's why, you know, kind of how we did it in those three pieces. Um, and I think that in terms of shooting it, you know, people ask that. They say, oh, you know, the female gaze and all that. But, you know, I was on the set, Anna Forster was on the set, Meryl was on the set, Katrina was on the set. And part of it was how we shot it was like, what do I want to look at? You know, so it was, you know, oh, gee, when she walks behind him, you know, she should drag her hand across his ass. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> um, I mean, that was, you know, it, it wasn't thought out like, you know, oh, what's the female gaze? It's just like we suddenly had this opportunity to go, wow, you know, what would I like to touch? What would I like to look at? <laughs> so I, I think it was pretty organic that way. Um, and I think in terms of writing a great sex scene, I mean, I, I do think that, I mean, a lot of the ones that I've written have been a, a version of what's in the book. Um, I, I think the ones that you make up, it's, it's hard as a writer because you're very vulnerable then. Because basically what you're saying is, this is what I find erotic. This is what I find sexy. And you're putting yourself out there and you're, you're, you're hoping somebody else doesn't go, Ooh, <laughs> that's creepy. Um, and and so that's I, for me. I'm writing those scenes. That's the hardest part. Um, I know I, I wrote one that actually we didn't end up shooting, but you know it was like trying to describe to the director. I'm like, well, you know, he's sort of kneeling down in front of her, and she's sort of going to put her foot on his chest, but I don't want it to look like gynecological. I, you know, I mean, and it's very weird. It's a very weird thing to do. And obviously the actors are involved, and the director, and everybody kind of contributes to that. So, Well, Matt and Tony, do you have anything to contribute to uh, tips on writing a great sex scene? <laughs> um, I love that nod. One of the greatest actors on Nine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it just made it long. I figured that was the best way to do it is, is really drag it out. Show it like it really is. And there's some good stuff. There's a little bit. It's uncomfortable. You knife to the throat. Knife to the throat. You know, good sex. Knife to the throat. Punishment sex. Very good. Turtleneck. Yeah. I, I, I think. Um, I think you. I think you have to, to go for it, you know, like Ann said, is you, as a writer, you just, you, you just have to give it up and just go for it. Don't think what your parents are going to think, or your wife or husband, <laughs> or whatever, because it, it seeps in. And I sometimes I always hear my mother say, Matthew. <laughs> she watches Outlander, I get texts every now and then, and all it says is, Matthew. <laughs> 
so I, I just gotta let that go and just go for it. So. Tell Diana you know. does. So <laughs> Tell you, do you get any feedback from people in your family? Um, yeah, I had to block an aunt of mine who kept texting me uh, with spoilers because she had read all the books and she was like, see an episode and then she'd go, well, I can't believe that in, in, you know, in book seven, so-and-so kills so-and-so. And I'd be like, aunt, what did you tell me? I don't want to know this. It's a spoiler. Uh, I'm one of the ones that uh, hadn't read the books when I started the show. Oh, okay. And so uh, I don't, I purposely don't read ahead. I just read the book we're working on because if you know all those things, you're going to write towards it. If you know two people fall in love or two people die, uh, you're going to, you're going to write towards that. And we don't want that. So two, two of us read all the books and two of us hadn't. Um, so yeah, uh, that, they haven't texted about the sex, but um, you know, I wrote the scene uh, in season two in the, in the day bed. Uh, where Claire and Jamie finally, you know, reconnect after the day. Um, along with Ron Moore, whose idea was to put it in the day bed because we were like, there's a gorgeous day bed there, someone's got to have sex. <laughs> <laughs> Every time we walk through the set, we'd peek in and go, someone's got to have sex. Mind of an Outlander writer, hey, there's a good spot for sex. <laughs> Some of the crew might have even snuck in there. I don't know. <laughs> Point, we thought it'd be funny to have them. Yeah, that would have been great. Having sex in there, but ultimately we decided um, it was Ron's idea to put to put Claire and Jamie in there because we wanted it to be really special when they reconnected after Jamie's trauma, and we wanted it. I think, like what Ann said, it's got to mean something. It's never gratuitous in our. You don't watch our show like some other shows to remain unnamed, where sex is gratuitous. It's just in the background going on. You're watching the scene and you're like, are those people? <laughs> um, we tried to make it mean something and then that scene it meant a lot and it was the, we call it the find me in the dark scene and I think it was really emotional and special because it wasn't about sexual acrobatics or, or anything like that. It was just like how do we reconnect after this trauma and it was, you know, and it was initiated by the woman um, and her saying, here's how we get past this. Find me in the dark. It's just you and me. There's no Jack Randall here. We don't need to do anything fancy. It's just me and you. We're connected by our souls. We've got this baby. You know, we wanted to show the sex of the pregnant woman. Kat was very, you know, passionate about wanting to show that. And I'm real proud of that scene because I feel like it was just uh, meaningful and the way, the perfect way to have them get back to each other is just to trust what was already there between them like, we don't have to try, it's there, find me in the dark, and, I, and that was yeah. Do you have anything to add as far as, I mean, are there any props you have in mind for next season that you might, might want to use? No. <laughs> I think the way I approached it from the beginning, and we, we talked about it at the beginning of the project, and we said, okay, look, there's a lot of sexuality in this book, it's a key part of the story. It's part of what people look for. We can't not do this, and why would you? Why would you not do it? But if we're going to do it, let's not do TV sex. And there's a lot of TV sex out there. And TV sex usually has a candle in the foreground. And it usually has a gauzy curtain being blown by yeah. men from someplace, and a wind machine. And it's usually sex that nobody in this room has ever had. <laughs> We just kind of said, let's not do that, and so I would have conversations with the directors uh, of each episode, and you know, the cast, and we just all said, let's try to make it real. Let's try to make it about human sexuality and, and you know, and how people really interact with each other, as opposed to, well, what's a cool shot or what's the position we haven't seen yet, you know, kind of kind of thing. It's just that make it integral to the story. I, well, I do think one other thing, though. I think one other moment that I. I was happy with was that we had in episode two, I think it was, and it's nice because in the room we can actually have these discussions where we had a scene where Jamie was um, pleasuring Claire um, and then somebody knocked on the door. And initially we talked about it, it was like somebody knocks on the door and then Jamie says, oh, I gotta get up and answer the door. And Claire says, no, 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 finish. And we're like, well, what if it goes the other way? You want it to be a woman's fantasy? Here's the fantasy. Knock on the door. She says, oh, you better answer the door. And he says, no, I'm going to finish. And it was great. It was great. It was a fantasy. Wow, man. Um, so, you know, but it's nice.
nice to it's nice to be able to be in a situation again in terms of female gaze where you go, okay, this is a woman's fantasy. Let's let's play that one out. So it was nice that we were able to do that. That was a good well, one. Uh, yeah, a lot of the the sex in the show is very real. There's what's interesting about the show is there there it's grounded in reality in many ways. It's grounded in real life. Yet at the same time, you guys have to face the issue of there are fantasy elements as, as well. You jump through time. So I actually wanted to talk about. Um, an episode that Matt wrote that was in the season two, Je Suis Prey, which ran fairly recently, where we see Claire's flashbacks. And I wanted to ask you how you decide when you're writing a script, what's the moment that I flash back? How do I get elegantly back and forth between her memories and what's happening here? What, as a writer, what kind of links do you put into the script? Um, well, that's actually... Uh, oddly enough, um, a decision most of the time they impose. Um, you know, I wrote the the script where I thought the elements would land and where they would they would uh, sing the most. And when we got into post, Ron Ron posts all our shows. Um, we we moved a few elements around a little bit, but it wasn't it wasn't much. But uh, as Ron always says, the the final draft is always written in editing. And, and I think for our show especially, since we film um, more than we ever use, uh, unfortunately, uh, that's why there's a lot of deleted scenes. Um, we, you know, in writing it, I, I tried to put it in the places that I thought fit her story as well as Jamie's story because it, it has to, that's where the puzzle pieces fit, is he's training and everything that he's doing is affecting her accordingly. Um, I think we only moved at the end of the day one piece um, and, and moved it slightly down. But uh, uh, coming for it, that's what it was. Is just trying to meld the two stories together, and, and I think we do that it, as writers in every episode, where you try to take an A story and a B story and meld them together and make them work seamlessly together. It is interesting on that, right? in terms of editing and post and the rhythm of the show. It's hard to even emphasize the point enough that. The way it works on the page is not always the way it works visually or in the rhythm of the show. I mean, I tend to think of TV shows as having bass lines and melody lines. And so when you're watching it, and then you always see the cut, generally speaking, you see the cut as it was intended, you know, as it was scripted. But the rhythm of the scenes will affect you differently when you see it as opposed to what the way you thought. And it's not, and it happens to all of us, my scripts as much as anybody else. There's the movie or the TV episode that you play in your head while you're writing it, you visualize it, and this is how it's gonna work, and this is how it's all gonna lay out, and this is the proper point to intercut these two storylines. But then you watch it and you realize, you know, the rhythm's off, it's, it's, uh, it's taking too long for that flashback, or it's not soon enough, or you know, whatever, and then you go in and you do another draft in the editing room. So you do all the post-production on the shows, you, you get the final say on, on how they look in the very end. So, so the other thing about that episode is, is we see Claire with PTSD, which is not, as you said, it's not in the book. So when you want to add something to the show that hasn't been in the books before, um, is that a discussion? You were talking about the discussion in the room. How was that discussion with adding the PTSD? Well, well actually, I'll, I'll, I'll say that it's not that it's not in the books. It's that it could be in the books. We just, you, you have to kind of pick those pieces out and go, oh, maybe that's the thing that affected her. Maybe that's, the, you know, she, we know she was a World War II nurse. We know that, that she heard uh, Jesus H. Roosevelt Christ. We know all these facts. It was the moment in the room where we go, oh, hey, maybe we can show these moments. And since Claire is in this section of the book is, is very internal, she's, she, she's thinking everything while Jamie's training, that's very hard to shoot. It's, it's hard to shoot a thought and, and make it, you know, and realize it. Um, so the way to get it out was to, hey, let's realize, let's shoot this practically. Let's get uh, Claire into some pants, as, as Terry and I like to do. Trous Trousers. <laughs> Thingies. Um, we, we, we do try to do that once a season at least. But, it, it was. It, it seemed organic to tell her story here, because we never we never talk about it. And uh, digging into the research of PTSD, you find out you don't you never know what triggers it. You don't know if it's that thing. And you know, uh, people 
were talking and, and I saw some articles that why didn't, you know, blackjacks almost rape a fur trader? Why, well, because she wasn't almost raped in World War II. It was seeing people uh, being trained, gunshots, all the things that, that came back to her. And then I, I think how we work the art was, you know, these are people now that she loves that she'll have to treat and care for, and they'll be coming back into the hospital, and that's the thing she couldn't deal with. You can always turn it off when it's someone you don't know. You know, and that, that's for all of us. We, we can turn it off. You watch the news every day where it's someone you don't know, and you can go, oh, what's for dinner tonight? But when it's someone you know, it matters. It really matters. And then you turn the television off, and you run to, uh, you run to take care of them. Well, Claire has had an incredible range of emotional experiences this season. Um, we've gotten into some very tragic moments for her. And um, Tony, I wanted to talk to you about the episode called Faith, which I think probably everyone, yes. Those boobs? <laughs> <laughs> a very uh, size. size. So I can tell everyone knows what happened in this episode. Um, so. I mean, and I thought Katrina's performance was incredibly powerful. Yeah. So tell us about approaching that episode. I mean, was, was it hard at all for you to write? Did you? How did you get into that? Uh, yeah, um, that episode. Uh, so it's a, it's the most special one to me, and it was very personal. And when I read the book, I just went, uh, uh, you know, it affected me the most of anything in Dragonfly, and I knew that I really wanted to write That's that. That's the one you really wanted to write, I right? really wanted to write it. Last season, I wanted the witch trial, and it was like, I don't care what else to write, but I have to write it. You know, and then you get through the other episodes, and they're good. You do your best, and you fall in love with them when you're writing them, but there's always one that's dear to your heart, and this one was. Um, and uh, But I think, yeah, it was so sad and such uh, emotionally you know, turbulent material that even I, I thought, I thought, I'm a pretty good writer. <laughs> you know, I can, I can do this. But I have to say, even when I tackled it on my first pass, um, you know, it's scary waters to go into. Um, and I think I didn't go, you know, quite deep enough in it. I had the baby stuff in it, but uh, it was originally called His Majesty's Pleasure, and it kind of focused more on the king and her sleeping with the king and that and the star chamber, which is all really flashy stuff, you know, and the other stuff was just more quiet. and. And, um, and it was Ron, who's just an amazing uh, guy to work for, and, and uh, one of his great traits is he trusts his writers, and um, and he we do have a shorthand because we worked together before, and he read my first pass, and it was like this is okay, you know, it's like a B plus, but um, I think you can do better. And he just said one thing to me, which is it's all about the baby. It's all about the baby, and uh, of course that was four pages of notes, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I didn't really need to read them because when he looked at me and said it's all about the baby, I knew what I had to do, and I was actually in Scotland already supervising uh, episode four, the dinner party episode, and I was like, how the hell am I going to write this? Th rewrite this thing while I'm here on the set, twelve hours a day. But I was in Scotland. It was raining. It was gray. It was perfect. I was depressed. You know? <laughs> so I just sat in my little apartment. I would be on the set all day long, come home exhausted, uh, drink quite a bunch of whiskey, and just sit by the window where the rain was just crying. It was like a novel or something. It was like being in a movie. And it was, it was I, I, when I got home, I told people it was like pure heroin or something, because when you're writing here, you have all the distractions of L.A. and I've got to be on the fucking 405 freeway. And I, gotta be so I mean, you have all these distractions, but there was just working on Outlander. And, I, and when I came home and had by myself, I could just dig into that script the way that I haven't since, you know, I was in my 20s writing my first scripts in a tiny apartment in, in North Hollywood or something. So, so I really uh, um, got into it. I took his words to heart, and I just really did a page one rewrite on it. For all you writers out there, you know how hard that is to do, and I rarely do that. Um, but I was like, I'm going to throw it all out and start over. And I renamed the episode Faith. Um, and I, and I, the chapters in the book, it's just so mag, you know, in the book it's like, or 12, it's huge in the book, but I knew I only had an hour to get it all in, and so, you know, I kept the King stuff, but I really dug into the, and I embraced the quiet moments of the baby and what Claire would feel like, and I trusted my actress, because Katrina is so amazing, and, 
And I knew that in so many places I didn't need words because I tend to overwrite. But I let it be like, I wanted that moment where she first woke up and just felt her belly and I knew she didn't need any dialogue because it would be on her face. And even in the, in the final version where I had all this voiceover, when Ron got into editing room, we just cut, cut, cut all the voiceover because it was all on her face. And I trusted those moments and I, I let, it, let it just be what organically it was, the pain you would feel. I wanted to do justice to people who lose children that are really, that matters. It's not just like, oh, we'll have another one. I knew what this meant to, to Claire and Jamie, and I wanted it to be something that would have broken up any other couple. But for them, this is something that makes them stronger, and I wanted to really dig into that. And uh, uh, originally, it actually had uh, more scenes past the graveyard. I uh, had all the potato things and some things that ended up in, in episode eight, because it went all the way to Jamie deciding to go to war, but when watched it, like Ron said, things have a rhythm, and this rhythm, the bass line was like, it came to a grinding stop after the grave because it, the rest of it just didn't belong in the story. You couldn't, it'd give you whiplash to recover that quickly and be back in Scotland. And so we moved it, you know, wisely to the next episode. And uh, we moved on that graveyard where, you know, Terry, even Terry, the veil that Terry made for, for uh, Claire to wear in the graveyard. That made me cry just to see the veil. You know, I saw what Claire was wearing, I started crying, and I said, I haven't even seen the scene. But, um, so I'm really proud of it, and I'm glad you guys love it, and love to make me cry. So. Too, was you had all that deep emotion in it, but then you had these other scenes too. I mean, it was it was just incredible. All the things that were, it was a powerful episode. It was like, yeah. was this really only an hour? Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, the Star Chamber scenes were. It almost like it should have been a different episode, but I fought to keep them together because I felt that organically they fit. Because this is part of the price Claire has to pay. I mean, she sold her she sold her soul to go to the king and sleep with him, and and you know. Like, a review pointed out, and I hadn't even thought of this, that um, that Monsieur Ferrez, who was you know with her in the beginning, Ooh. trying to save the baby, that in the previous episode, in Matt's, when he talks about what he does when he draws and quarters people, that he, reach, he reaches in and pulls out your beating heart in his hand. And someone in some podcast said, he reached into Claire and pulled out her beating heart when he pulled out that baby. And I was like, oh. I didn't even think of that, honestly, when I was writing, but when I heard that, I was like, oh my God, I almost went off the freeway. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, that, that, that is what happened. So we, we needed the star chamber, we needed the danger, we needed Claire to be willing to go to these lengths to save Jamie. Um, and so it, it worked all together, um, but it was a, it was a, a big undertaking and it was really <coughs> proud of it, yeah. yeah. Well, talk about saving Jamie. Um, Ron, I wanted to talk to you about villains and creating villains, and we know we have a big villain in this <coughs> show, Blackjack Randall. I thought you were going to say Fergus. <laughs> <laughs> And, and you um, and Ira Bear, who's not here tonight, um, another writer on the show, wrote the Wentworth prison scenes with, uh, with Jamie and Blackjack. Tell us about what it was like to put those scenes together. Those are also some very powerful moments. And, um, and how, do you, how do you not make a villain flat? I mean, Blackjack is a very, still a very complicated guy. So how do you keep him... Well, I guess I started from the premise um, that Blackjack had to be a human being. He had to be a person. That if he was a monster, if he was like something that you could say was not human, then it was kind of easy to dismiss him and the horror of what happened would be diminished. But if you make him more three-dimensional, if you understand that he is a human person, just like all of us, and he has certain frailties, and he has certain vulnerabilities, and certain uh, identifiable human emotions, that the horrific things that then happen would carry even more weight. So that was sort of the place that, that we started from. Uh, those last two episodes of season one you know, were very difficult uh, scenes, it was very difficult material, a lot of it was in the book, some of it was stuff that we resequenced or, 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 or you know, invented for the show's purposes. Um, I have to give a lot of credit to that to Ira, actually. I, I got to a place on the finale, like Ira wrote uh, 115, which was the penultimate episode of season one, and then I was supposed to write uh, 16, 116. And I got into the middle of 116, and I 
got to a place where I was a little bit lost and wasn't quite sure how to really do this anymore. I, I could feel that when I was writing the scenes was very surface and didn't really dig into any emotional depth. And I was writing those scenes and it, they became just kind of about torture and about pain. And I, I knew that I wasn't really getting into any of the meat of it. So I called up Byron and I said, let's just co-write this because I, I, I need some help on this. So then he really brought a lot of the depth and the emotion into that episode. And this, the, the show just started to sing. And once we had the first draft, then it went to the director, Anna Forrester, and then uh, a lot of the credit also goes to Sam Hewen and Tobias Menzies, who then spent, we dedicated time, yes, we dedicated time uh, for them to rehearse. You know, we, we took out production days and let them rehearse those sequences, you know, one-on-one uh, -on -one with each other and the director, and then Ira and I kind of went in and saw some dress rehearsals. It was very, like, volatile material, it was very intense material, and then we just said we need to give them space to sort of deliver this. So a lot of the power of that episode is really illustrative of, you know, the process of television and the collaborative nature of the medium and all of us trying, you know, each one of us putting in our parts, each one of us recognizing what our limitations might, might be and trusting that, you know, through the process of all of us working together, we're going to, like, come up with something that's really, really great. Who, who else among, which of you guys has written a blackjack scene that stands out for you as far as, well, I haven't written a ton of blackjack, but I, I do know actually he's in 12, which yeah, I, I yeah, liked a lot. Um, you haven't seen I, it yet. They haven't seen it yet. Yeah, they haven't seen it yet. Spoiler free. Tell us all. But I think one of the things, going off what you said, Ron, I think that we have these discussions in the room about writing villains, and I think we talk about, nobody gets up in the morning and goes, hmm, I think I'll be evil today. <laughs> um, and for me, one of the best villains in um, literature is Komarovsky in um, uh, Dr. Zhivago, if you've ever seen it. Um, and he's a great character because you really feel like Robert Bolt sat down and wrote those scenes from his point of view. And, and that you really think to yourself, okay, if this was the Black Jack Randall show, what, how would he be approaching these scenes? They're so much more interesting. That's and, Anne and the he's, Kenny. As you say, he's a person. And, and I think everybody has rationale for why they do the things they do. Everybody thinks, again, I don't think people get up and say, I'm evil. They think, I have a, a real reason for doing this. This, is, this makes sense to me. Um, so I think, yeah, that, that always makes him a much more interesting character to write. Um, so yeah, and, and in 12, yes, he has... Um, yeah, I won't say what he does, but uh, and it's it saves and, uh, the world. <laughs> he does. He actually takes flight with a cape. And, um, no, um, but yeah, I think that's really important that the, that the uh, villains are. And you know, Diana's always talking about I'm Jack, Black Jack Randall. But I think that's kind of a way of saying that, which is yeah, he's he's a person, and you have to write him from that point of view. Well, I, I do think in episode twelve, um, there is a I think you do humanize him. Which is which is great. You 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 kind of feel for him in in, mm -hmm. in a way, and I think that's something that Ron's always said is that we can't we can't have uh, our villains be these these uh, cartoon characters, you know, who who just did they have one goal? I want to kill this person or I want to do this to this person. You have to go. God, what made them? What made them want to do this? You want to ask questions about them, and I don't think the cartoon characters really care. It's just you know. This Tom wants to kill Jerry. I think the biggest thing we did was in season one when we did episode six, when uh, the Garrison Commander episode. It was an episode with it's basically like a, a two a two man play. I mean it's Claire and Jack Randall in a room for virtually the entire episode. And when we decide when we came up with the idea of telling, excuse me, the story of Jamie's flogging through Jack's point of view, that opened up the character in a very profound way because. You would normally tell that story through Jamie's eyes and Jamie's memory, but there wasn't much to say about that, truth to tell. It was sort of, what's Jamie's story going to be? Well, it sucked. <laughs> it really sucked. Boy, boy, howdy, did this suck. A hundred, a hundred times. A hundred times did this suck. I can't even tell you how much this sucked. And just when you thought it sucked, it sucked again. But Jack's point of view was a fascinating one. To, to What was... The story of the guy that was doing it and what did he feel and how did he think about it 
that like just opened up the character and suddenly the whole you know the, the whole template of what the show is about and who the players were really shifted at that point you know and, and i think you know our villains you know column can be considered a villain you know, Dougal obviously is a villain, and and you know, and and uh, I, I I dare you say it, Leary. There is a hero of the whole story. But, we'll get that later. but I mean, they they, you know, for me, I, I know people hate her, but this is this is a a sixteen year old girl, who who who, uh, Jamie takes a beating for. And then he makes out with her. Right. Come on. Well, no, what's wrong? I mean, what sixteen-year-old girl is gonna go? Hey, he kind of likes me a little bit. Yeah. And then he comes home, and he says, "Hey, I'm married to this other woman. I think she's gonna feel bad." And, and to me, that kind of rounds out. That that makes her okay to be a villain. She has a reason to be a villain. And, so, uh, <laughs> right, right, right. another big aspect of the show is uh, there are a lot of fight scenes, and they're all very different. I mean, we had a dinner party fall apart. You know, we have a duel. You know, we have some scrapping in the Scottish Highlands. And we have battles coming up. And I, I did an interview with your stunt coordinator, Dominic Priest. And he said that, you know, I can, chore I can choreograph a fight, I can do my best fight choreography, but it's not gonna mean anything to the viewers unless there are good beats in between where the actors say something or they're given a moment to respond. So how do you guys write those kinds of scenes where it's not just the fight choreography, but how do you decide where to take those beats? And do you also have kind of a story arc happening in the fights with the beats? Who wants to talk about that? Uh, I find fight scenes difficult to write, frankly. Action scenes in general are difficult to write because they're almost technical. <coughs> like, he throws him across the room, he smacks into the wall, he falls down, he gets up, he grabs the chair, he, the chair flies across the room, it hits him in the head, he ducks. I mean, it becomes very sort of mechanical. And the truth is that the stunt coordinator and the director basically like throw it all out. So, because they're going to come up with whatever they're going to come up with in terms of what the location is, what's available, what the, you know, what are the parameters of, of the scene. Ultimately, I do feel like what you said, there is an emotional core that's going through any fight. There's an idea of the beginning, middle, and end of this scene, like any other dramatic scene. So, why are they fighting? How do they fight? What's the twist in the fight? Where does it end? And how is that moving the story forward? are sort of what you have to concentrate on as a writer, but it's really easy to get distracted by the fight choreography and start to get obsessed with, well, I want him to reach up at the top of the ladder and he's gonna reach for this thing and you, get, you can spend hours, if not days, just trying to work out in your mind's eye how this all plays out. And then it doesn't mean anything, because, oh, the set doesn't work that way, so let's do something else. You know, <laughs> yeah, I think um, I was just, um, you know, think about episode 11, which is another one you all haven't seen yet, but there's the big scene with Sandringham and all of that. And that was crazy. First of all, I hate writing fight scenes. I just like to write, and then they fight. Because <laughs> I really am not interested in that. And, and as you say, once you get in the set, because we're on locations, so suddenly, you know, yeah, they run in that door, and they run in that door, and then they go, well, there are no doors. It's like, or they have to come through the window. But yeah, it's the choreography of it. So much of that happens on the set, and it's with the actors, and, and figuring out, okay, this one, this is what this is about for this one, and this is what it's about for that one. That scene in Eleven, remember we went down, and, and they showed it to us like three different ways, and then I, I actually had a piece of paper, and I had like coins on the paper, and I'm like, okay, the nickel is Jamie, and the, the penny is Claire, and I'm trying to figure out who everybody was. And then in editing, it's huge in editing, just to keep oh, yeah. the momentum and the energy of the fight and everything. So it's a huge collaboration. It's kind of a catch-22, because if you just write, and then they fight, right. they all immediately turn to you and say, well, what did you have in mind for this? How did you see this fight developing? And then you'll say it, and then they'll go, no, that doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Would the editing have a lot to do with it, too? 
The editing, in my experience, um, the editing, a lot of it has to do with just the energy of the thing, you know, who you're looking at, where you are, because when we're choreographing it, and also it's fascinating because you have something going on over here, and all the other actors are sort of standing there, and as you're on the set, you're thinking, well, what the hell are those guys doing while this is going on? But when they edit it, they're, sh they're taking your head and saying, you're looking here, you're looking here, you're looking here, and you're not thinking about the fact that, oh, that guy's just standing over there, if, if it's working right. So I, I'd love to, speaking of, of fight scenes, I want to talk about your writer's room and how it works a little bit. <laughs> are you, are you guys all together, I mean, who, who, how many writers are there total on the show, and do you kind of, what's your process? Do you all get together in a room and sort of sketch out the season and then assign, you know, scripts? How does, how does the room work? And do you guys really, come on, any, any fight scenes, any chairs thrown, uh, any? It is okay. definitely a volatile room at times. Okay, uh, tell me more. Th this is the writing staff plus Ira Bear for the first two seasons. The new additions to our writing staff are sitting right over here, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, stand up. Yeah, stand up. Yeah. These are the new writers. Direct all future complaints over there. Um, so it's so volatile. So how does that It is volatile. I mean, it starts with all of us in the room together. Okay, let's block out the season. And because it's an adaptation, you've got the book. We have our, our writer's assistants, uh, some of whom are here, I believe. Some, no? Okay. Yes, one is here. Um, they break down the book into uh, tentpole moments, like the big moments of the book and chapters of the book. And we say, okay, put the whole thing up on the board. So we have this big board filled with cards. And step one is, all right, let's divide it into hours. Okay, there's 13 episodes. Let's start like saying, this is the first hour, this is the second. And then let's drill down into individual hours. Now the assistants give us more of the details of each scene within that hour. And we start looking at it and say, well, this doesn't quite work as an hour television. Let's move this over here. What's the dramatic high point of this of the show? What's this episode really about? And this still isn't working. Let's take this piece from the next episode and pull it into that. And you just start like you know working through the process. And again, the argument comes primarily from what do you keep and what do you change? You know, in our over the, over the past couple of seasons, that's the big question, and that's the legitimate question. It's never illegitimate in our room to say, you know, to argue about whether you keep it or whether you change it, because that's really the question. What makes the story work? How does this, an hour of television, you know, how does the general viewer who doesn't know from the books, are they able to follow the story? Are they invested in this hour? And also, have we lost the book readers who love this and who are like invested in this particular line or that particular character or this particular description of the scene? And how do you sort of you know, navigate that field. And I kind of, I was trained in the system at Star Trek where the showrunner and the one who runs the writer's room is kind of first among equals. We're all equal. We're all going to have an equal opinion. I try to make it where the best idea in the room wins. Ultimately, yes, yeah, somebody has to have the last word and say, okay, this is what it's going to be. And ultimately, that's my job. But a big part of the job is listening and sort of saying, well, I think it's this. And then if Matt says, well, no, maybe it's that, that you have to be willing to hear that and go, well, maybe it is that, you know? Right. You guys, do you have moments that you remember that you really fought for that made it into the show? <laughs> oh, my God. The biggest fight <laughs> we ever had was about the Star Chamber. There's a uh, lot of contenders for the biggest fight we ever had. So <laughs> that's a pretty big statement. Well, that was one. The, it, I, 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 believe, I believe it was because I, I was in Scotland and I came back to the room and... Uh, I'm not going to say who, but I'll just say it was divided. No, 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 it was divided when I came back. We're they can't even right agree now. about We're that. fighting right now. We can't agree where I was. <laughs> what was the fight? Well, uh, you had a problem with the star chamber. Point finger. No. Call me out. It's all right. Okay. Well, the problem with the you star chamber. You have a contract, so you're set. <laughs> <laughs> problem with the star chamber and the problem and you who've read the book know that you know when you're judging two guys and you're having trouble judging them and one of them pulls a poison out of his sleeve and goes hey let's drink this poison and we'll decide you know who the bad guy is 
uh, everyone who's watched Law and Order for years and years knows that the suspect doesn't get to, the accused doesn't get to make the test to see who's guilty. So that was a problem Ron had with it, which was a very legitimate problem. And we run into this a lot where there's something maybe it doesn't quite make sense because when you're reading the book, there's a lot of times where your imagination will fill in things or you're just reading so fast, but just want to get to Claire and Jamie having sex. <laughs> 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 uh, you, know, but you don't find as many logic problems when you're reading it, but when you're watching it on the screen, you do. And we didn't want a bunch of viewers to go, wait a minute, you know, why are they doing that? So, you know, some often Ron will point out problems and go, this just doesn't make sense to me. I want to embrace it. I want to love it, but sorry, it's not making sense. And to his credit, what he'll usually do is say, and because we'll go, we can make it work. We can make it work. Just, just, just trust us. So then he'll go, all right, write it. And a lot of bosses would, and they'd say, forget it, you know, do it my way. We don't have time. It, uh, clock's ticking. Um, and he'll say, write it your way, and let me look at it. So we have, you know, we have a pass to do it our way. And if we show it to him, you know, half the time we'll go, all right, you convinced me. That's cool. Or you won me over. And, and that rarely have. That's a rare quality. Uh, but there's times he goes, nah, still not buying it. Sorry, still not buying it. And that was one of those times. In, were a lot of different opinions in the room on this star chamber. At one point, we were even like, should we just cut the scene, the scene because it's not working? Well, I did. I suggested to Ron, knowing that, knowing what he would say, he is that, no hey, no. let's just cut this thing. And he said, we can't do that. We have no, to make it it's work. A, it's a fan and favorite in the book. And it was a tentpole, and we had to get, we we had to get through it. Gary wanted to build that set, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we did find a way to fix it. was already it. But we did find a way to fix it, which is to say, like, we took a, we took a little page out of Law and Order and went, well, the evidence would be there. So why don't we just pull all the stuff from the apothecary and, and Master Raymond's shop, and then, because we wanted Claire, she's the judge, she's got to come up with the test for, you know, how to tell, but she doesn't, she doesn't have a sleeve to pull poison out, so we added the evidence table, and then she goes, hey, let's use the bitter cascara, which she knew what wouldn't kill either of them, because Claire didn't want to kill anybody. You know, she wanted to save both of them as much as she hated, um, you know, the comp, because he tried to poison her. She's not a murderess. She would, she want to see him die. So she's like, hey, if both of them live, can they get out of here? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, we'll see. Um, and then Master Eamon, you know, actually, we needed a setup for that because again, Ron was like, suddenly this guy just does slide pan out of nowhere, you know, when, when he puts it. And so we were actually shooting episode four and we came up with the idea of like, oh, well, let's, let's put it in the scene when he's in the shop that he does his slide pan with the sheath knuckles in this earlier episode. And luckily, because it was shooting, I literally, I think the night before, added that to that scene and went down there and said, you gotta do this slide pan. Well, that's a, that's a good example is that, that there are a lot of things that work on the page because you you fill in all that, but when you see it, when you actually have to see it happen, um, a good example is, is episode uh, nine that just came out, is that on the page, William Gray listens to Claire and Jamie having a conversation, and then he attacks Jamie. And as I wrote the scene, if he heard the conversation that they were having, anybody would go, well, that's a married couple having that conversation. She's telling him to eat apples. So he doesn't get scurvy, and, and, and I went to Ron. And I'm like, this doesn't work. How can I? How can I have William Gray at a campfire, you know, listening to this conversation, and and rationalize? Well, that's Red Jamie, and he's holding that woman hostage. It just didn't work. So what we did is what we did is we enclosed it. We put it inside. We had Jamie leave. He saw. He just saw Red Jamie. He never heard the conversation. And we took Claire out of the equation. And it worked, and that's one. Of, that's adapting. That's that's taking what's there, and having it make sense visually instead of what's on the page. I think the the we biggest have, ar argument I remember was over the um, when Jenny and Claire were going to go save Jamie. Do you oh, remember? Oh, that was an epic. That one. was a big one. <laughs> because, and I remember Tony and I are like, like, okay, so they jump on the horses and they're out there and they're and they're doing this blah blah blah. And I felt like I had a bungee cord on my back. It was like pulling because Ron's like. <laughs> Well, what's their plan? <laughs> and we're both like, what do you mean, what's their plan? I said, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. And to your credit, I will say, the energy that came off of him was, I want this to happen. Please explain it to me in a way that I can understand. <laughs> and we went round and round. I remember saying to Ron, okay, imagine that your kids are on your front yard. Somebody grabs them, 
and then they take them, what will you do? Would you round up the posse or would you just go after them? And he's like, well, I'd probably call people. It was just like, <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't I call the cops? <laughs> you, did, you were like that, that scene from Marathon Man. You just kept saying, like, is it safe? It, what's the plan? What's, <laughs> what's the plan? plan? What do they want to do? Yeah, what are they planning to do? But it ended up working out fine. It ended and up again, working. But we, again, we, I, we I, had I, a we, scene. We had a scene where uh, uh, Ian had wanted to call the troops. He wanted to do it, right. and, and the Lollybrook men and it was and, and Claire explained it. It's not safe if you do this. We need to go alone, and that was enough. That was enough to say, hey, that's the thing that tied it together. Right. But you know, any any good writing staff, sh there should be fights, and those of you who have been on staff, you know there are, but Wait, they're not. No. <laughs> not for you guys. Uh, but no, you know, we fight because we're so passionate about the material, and I think that's why Ron, you know, puts up with us because I've been on a lot of staffs where they fight, and it's not because everyone loves the material and is trying to make it better. It's petty things and alliances, and it's nasty, and it's not fun. It's not fun to go to work, and it's like there's not enough money in the world to pay me to go and be miserable every day with a group of people that I don't respect or I don't want to work with. And, and that's what's different about our show. We love each other, we respect each other even when we disagree, and if we, we can have a knockdown drag out in the room, and then we go to lunch and we drink well, a little that's, whiskey. That's the, way I start, that's the way I started in this business. At Star Trek, they taught me that basically it's like that old Warner Brothers cartoon with Wile E. Coyote and Sam the, the Sheepdog. Yes. So you both go to work in the morning with your lunch pails, and hey Sam, and hey Wile E, and you punch the clock, and then suddenly it's like <laughs> And then you go to lunch, and you're like, hey, you know, that's kind of funny. And then after lunch, the whistle blows, and you're at each other again. And it's just, it's, it ain't personal, it's just business. It's just like trying to get the best story out. I think that's it exactly. It, it's never personal. You never, you never bring up anything personal. It's just like this is what I believe the story should be, and, and ultimately it lands on Ron to to uh, decide that. He's the referee sometimes, but uh, that's a tough job. Well, I, you know, I love hearing what you learned early on in your career, and you know, people in this room are at all various stages of their career. Some are just starting out. So I'm curious from, you know, we can go down the line, whoever, whoever wants to jump in and start, uh, what did you learn at your first writing job that you sort of carried with you that still is with you when you come into the Outlander room? I just looked at you. I don't know, I mean, I think it's, at my first job? Oh my God, I can't remember. Well, that you get rewritten, that was one, yes, I remember. Um, uh, I think over the years, I've sort of learned that you, um, yeah, just to, to try to, to make a story make sense. Uh, a big one, I think, for me is the worst kind of showrunner is somebody who won't make a decision. Um, I've worked for those people, and you want to, like, blow your brains out. Um, so even if you decide something that, after our big argument, isn't what I wanted, at least I know what I'm doing now. And I think then, as a writer, you're an artist and a craftsman, and so you argue the things that you want to argue, and you argue them from that sort of artist point of view, and then once you know what you have to do, your job is to be a craftsman and to really do that thing as well as you can, <laughs> and it's very satisfying. So uh, I guess, I don't know that that wasn't my first job, but over the years, I would say that's what I've come out of it with. What about you, Matt? Did you, or? Um, I, I, think, I think the thing that, that over the years is that it's it's hard to understand what somebody else wants uh, often. Sometimes you, you, you know, like Anne said, you, you bring what you, who you are to the table, and that's why they hired you. That's why why you get hired is, is for your opinion, basically. And you bring it to the table, and, and some people, um, you, you, they communicate very well. Some showrunners communicate, this is what I want. So you can go out and write that. Ron is an example is he'll say exactly this is this is the thing you need to find in your script so you can go out and find it other people um, and i believe it was ann that told me this once is that uh they what was the instrument you said oh well my theory is that you have showrunners who are orchestra conductors yes who will um as long as you're playing the same piece of music you can play a flute yep. you can play an oboe you can play a guitar and as long as you're playing the same piece of music, we can do this together. And for me, those are the best showrunners. 
And the other person is the person who plays an oboe, and all they can hear is an oboe. So if so you don't play an like oboe, a fugal horn or you can make something right. right. So if you play a flute, it doesn't matter if you're playing the same piece of music. If you can't play a flute horn, you're not going to succeed at this. And so yeah. And, and there are there are those that out there that they only hear their music, and no matter what you play, it doesn't fit into their symphony symphony and and it's hard to work for those people thankfully Ron is a conductor that can kind of hear it all and he puts it all together and in building a team he, he picks the violin and the flute and the trump trumpet and the trombone I believe it was uh, and he, you know we, we we hopefully we we create a symphony but there are those that you know no matter what you play they're not going to hear it and then that's where the rewriting comes um, for me, I think it, it might have to be um, authenticity uh, because my first show that I, that I worked on was uh, China Beach, um, which was oh. awesome. And it was about, you know, Vietnam, and I was like in my early 20s and was like, I didn't know anything about Vietnam, and yet I'm on a show where, you know, these are TV shows, but they're also depictions of people's real lives, people who live these, these things. And, and so we put it on for entertainment, but it, it, it has to do justice to the source material, which is the real thing. And we, we felt a real responsibility on that show to, to uh, and I, I started as a researcher, as did Matt. And, uh, and so I learned a lot from that before I became a writer to be the person who had to look up the real stories, interview real veterans, find out what this really, how things really were so that we could, what we put on the screen in addition to be entertaining could be, could honor these people who live these real lives. In fact, there's a World War One veteran here tonight, so I wanna, Oh, I need that guy. And you know, Culloden, and this is about the wars in Scotland, and and I think we all feel here feel a responsibility to uh, to for this to be authentic. We do a huge amount of research. Um, we want to get it right. We want to honor the people that fought for what they believed in, for Scottish independence, or for their putting their king on the throne, or their religion, or whatever it is. These people really lived. And when, when we were in Scotland, you know, it's all a story in a book. But when you go there and you walk the you know fields of Preston Pans, or you go to some of these. You know, just driving on the on the highway there and passing a sign that says Falkirk five miles that way. You go. That was a battle. You know, there's Stirling Castle. There's whatever. And we we love Scotland. We want the people to watch this. We don't want it to be a fairy tale. We want to show the real deal. And our people are fictional characters, but they could have lived in this time. And we want it to be, you know, to do justice to the real people who live who live this story. And that's what I learned in my first job. And we try to do it now. And I'm I'm proud of what we do. Well, that, that's a great transition into, I wanted to ask one final question, then we'll take some questions from the audience. But um, Matt and Tony, you wrote the season finale, the season two finale, you wrote that together. So, you know, without giving any spoilers, maybe you could tease a little bit about what we might see and maybe share with us your biggest challenge in writing the season two finale. It's all a dream. <laughs> Bob, Bob Newhart and yeah. his wife wake up. Yeah. The other big dream, the uh, Bobby Wade oh, yeah. Dallas. <laughs> it's all Frank's dream. What's the biggest thing, the, the toughest thing for you guys in that episode? I think the toughest thing was going, um, the timeline is, is uh, because when we, we well, I'm not going to give away anything, but when we saw the first, uh, the director takes a cut, as, is, as many people know, and we saw that, and he literally in a linear fashion and um, it wasn't how Tony and I had originally scripted it and it was a it was a shock to see it that way because we, we, we thought so we had to put it back together and post the way it was scripted um, I think that was that was the toughest part was to try to fit um, uh, not giving anything away the 68 story and um, the the uh, 46 story, the 1746 story. Um, there are a couple characters that'll pop up uh, that you might know. But, um, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and we're, 
in working in working their story into it, and and, and uh, Ron kind of kept the reins on that because you know you want to tell a story there, you want to tell their story there, and uh, it was like I put the brakes on because that's not their it's not their story, it's it's obviously Claire and Jamie's story, and we always have to we had to remind ourselves as we were writing, um, this is just a just a a little sprinkle of these two characters, and then we, we move forward with them in next season. Okay. Well, oh, I'm sorry. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think you'll be happy to see some things you're not expecting to see, and it, there's some stuff you're expecting to see, but it'll be delivered in a different way, because we like to keep you guys on your toes. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, before we ever wrote it, we sat down and just said, you know, we have a lot of great material here, but what do we want to see that's not there? What do we want to see? What would be our dream yeah. scenes? And both of us were like, spent days just going, okay, here's my list. Here's what I want to see. And he's like, well, one, of them, on. one of them, when we pitched it to Ron, he, his eyes lit up. He's like, oh, I like that thing. <laughs> and, and that's what you want. When you pitch something to the showrunner and he lights up and he's like, yeah, I like that, you know, you, you it feels it feels good to rather than uh, no make it better. <laughs> that was not that was not so good. Not that Ron does that. But. One of the joys of show running is when your staff surprises you. I, mean, I used to say that on Battlestar was go out and write something about these characters I that would shock me or, or take me in a different direction. Yeah. So even though we're doing an adaptation, part of the joy for my job is to every once in a while hear something I didn't expect that really works. You go wow that's really cool. Let's do that. Well, that, that's another thing that, that you allow us to do, uh, especially in outlines when we, when we first go off to write, is uh, some showrunners, you come back and it's, if it's not in the outline, they want to know why, why did you, why did you vary, and Ron has never, never done that, he's always, it's it surprised me, so you can, you can bring yourself to the table, you can, if something's not working, you can fix it in, in your, in your storytelling, and bring it to him, and if he loves it, it stays, and that's the great thing, it's best idea wins. So. Okay. Well, let's, we don't have a whole lot of time, but we do want to take some questions, and what I do ask is that, um, first we take questions from people who are, are writers, working on scripts, if you have writing-related questions. Um, uh, there are people with mics around here, yes, right here? Uh, let's bring the mic to you. And if you could tell us your name, and then if you have a question for a specific person, let them know, okay? Uh, my name is Sabrina Almeida, and this is a, I think a question for Ron, but maybe the whole room, depending on how it's done. Uh, it's more of an industry, kind of an industry question. What do you look for when you're looking at writer's assistants and writer's PAs? Um, is it always, you know, somebody recommended from somebody that's already on staff, or how does that process work? Uh, that's a tough one, you know, it, it always kind of depends on where you are in the season, how fast you have to get somebody in the room. I mean, ideally, someone who's, like, going to be part of the support staff for a writing uh, office, I, I feel should be interested in writing. Like, they want to be a writer, and ideally, they, for us, they'd like to be a, an hour drama writer, because that's really what you're going to learn, and that's what you're going to be most involved with. So somebody that's, you know, wants to pursue that path. I, then I want to bring them in to the support staff because I feel like they're learning something, they're going to go somewhere with it. And I know that there's a lot of people out there who want to do that path. So if it's someone who's more interested in production or more interested in comedy or more interested in various other things, then you probably go, well, there's so many people who want to do this, this particular position, and it is a great little uh, uh, doorway in that, you know, usually I'm drawn to sort of find someone from, from that angle. And would you always want to see an outlander spec from someone or for a writer's assistant or no no, no that, that that's asking a little too much okay. it's like okay just show me you know if you're if, if you're an entry level position and you're just trying to break in it's like god love you and i'm not going to ask you to like kill yourself you don't have to spec out the, you don't have to paint my house you just have to like, be a good person have some good references show that you're eager you know do the job tony's painting the house <laughs> With historical fiction, I know very often you want to have some sort of current themes that resonate. Is there any kind of current themes that guide your guys' writing as you are working on Outlander? Uh, I don't know particularly if there's any contemporary themes other than, you know, it's, it's a human story, so you're, you know, there's certain things that are eternal and that are, that are kind of timeless, the, you know, human interaction and love and loss and, 
you know, love and death and war and that kind of thing. I don't know. It's not really like Battlestar. Battlestar was a much more, uh, it was a show about where we were at that moment. It was about what was happening in the culture and society and in the world. And there was an, you know, an overt effort on our behalf to sort of make those things relate to what we were doing in, the, in this series. This is a different gig and it's a different challenge. So I don't know that we talk a lot about what's going on in the world around us. We don't talk about it, but I mean, there are certain, like you said, elements. I mean, people preparing for war, happens. it's happening around the world. Uh, it just so happens to be um, uh, PTSD Awareness Month, and, and we aired uh, Claire's PTSD in, in, in the month, so I mean, that was... Or Scotland taking the vote on their... Yeah. 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 That happened while we were there, and we yeah. got you getting the great conversations with cab drivers, like, what do you think about that boy being prepared for yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but It's very interesting. It's all the same stuff that's going on today, and it's what went on with America when we, you know, so a lot of themes do resonate. Do we have some more questions? Um, yes, right here. <laughs> Oh, okay, thank you. Um, my question is about, uh, from a writer's point of view, the use of voiceover narration in this, which of course is so much a part of the book. For, I mean, I read books on audio, audiobooks, so I know it belongs there, but it seems to me that there are certain um, episodes that, you know, they're obviously from Claire's point of view most of the time, so you don't seem to need the VO, you don't need the narration, and then sometimes it just comes in. And I'm wondering if that's something that comes about in editing, where you realize, we need it here, or no, it's fine as is, and then you're writing it in the edit room, or you say, you know, God, we did this whole episode with only like four lines of VO. Is there any plan to that? Uh, at the outset of the, of the project, you know, uh, I think that uh, Chris Albrecht, who's the president of STARS, felt like the voiceover would be kind of interesting for us, because it was, it was sort of something that had fallen out of fashion in television, and so that was an intriguing thing to him and to the network, and I kind of agreed with that. I went, yeah, you know, right? There, that has kind of fallen out of fashion, so let's go down that road. Uh, and I think what started to just sort of evolve over time was you just started to judge it episode by episode. We always write voiceover in the actual scripts, but then when you get into editing and you're actually watching the show and watching the cut, you have a different sense of it, and oftentimes you're going, I don't need voiceover here, or I do need it here, or you know, this voiceover isn't right, you rewrite it in the editing room. And it's really kind of something you have to kind of judge when you see the final product. What is tricky is that there are times when, if you write voiceover in the script, the director and the cast then will create a moment for the voiceover in the, in the shooting of the scene. Like they will you know, pay attention to giving Clara a close up in that moment or they'll create space in the way the scene plays because they know a voiceover is going to be there. So later in editing, it's like, oh, well, this is pretty simple. And if in editing later you realize, oh, I want a voiceover in this scene, and they haven't created it beforehand, it gets a little trickier. Okay, where am I cutting to while this is happening? There's not like a convenient space to lay this in. So it's, there's not a simple answer to it. We kind of do it you know, on the fly a little bit more than we used to in season one. Season one, it was a little bit more planned, and it was a lot more voiceover, and now it's a little bit more... Yeah, we're gonna try it here, but maybe we'll find it later, kind of a, kind of thing. Oh, there was a question. Yeah, in the in the pink dress. <laughs> um, I was just wondering uh, the challenges of adapting material versus uh, writing when it when you don't have something to adapt from. Do you find it easier or harder to do? Like you talked about the process. Um, so how does it compare? Say, Battlestar Galactica. Galactica versus Outlander. So original versus adapted. Yeah, we could probably all weigh in on this. I mean, for me, it's they're very different muscles. I mean, I, I was surprised at how different a process it is. You know, and when you're doing an original piece for me as, as a showrunner, there's that moment that the place I always go back to is there's a moment in a story break where you're sitting there and you're banging your head against the wall for this and you just can't make this fucking story work. <laughs> and eventually you can kind of go, you know what? Screw this. What else have we got? let's just throw this out, or let's start all over, or, you know, Matt, you had that idea about that other episode, and you can just, like, wing it and go in some other direction. And with an adaptation, you never have that moment, and that frustrates me, because there are definitely times when I'm like, wow, I want to throw this out, but I, I'm not, and I can't, and I have to stick with it, and we're going to be disciplined, and we're going to stay in this room until we crack this goddamn thing. Um, 
the joy of it is that you, to me, you have comfort in knowing where you're going. Like at the beginning of each season of an original, there's a certain terror about, do we really know where this is going? Do we really have an end to this season? Yeah, we'll figure that out later. And then at certain points, you wake up in the dead of night going, wow, I have no idea if this is gonna work. And with an adaptation, you know. It's like, oh yeah, there is an ending. We actually have a roadmap ahead. Yeah, I, I, I feel, I love doing adaptations. And for just that best part of the reason is yes, because you have the end. I, I remember going into you know meetings on new shows and you'd think, you'd go in and you'd say, so where's it going? And the guy who wrote the pilot would be like, well, I don't know. <laughs> and and you think, really? Like, wow. So I love that. And I also like, for me, um, it's like having the world's best writing partner because they have great ideas, but they, you don't have to take them if you don't want to. You can just say, no, I'm going to make a decision on that. I don't want that. You don't have to negotiate, which I kind of like. Well, I like that that uh, you probably if we didn't if we didn't know where we were going, we probably didn't wouldn't get a two season pickup. So I kind of like that. Uh, we have time a couple a couple more. This lady right here. <laughs> Got your agent working for you. <laughs> Good to have representation. See, it works. Thank you. One of the things I really appreciate about Outlander is the um, equality of the relationship between Jamie and Claire. And uh, like in, I think it was the latest episode, where um, Claire says to Jamie, just go say thank you, do it for me. And he's saying to go over to so Larry. And, and he's like, I don't know why I'm saying thank you, but I'm saying thank you. And, and I just feel like, I just want to tell you that I really appreciate that, and I don't know how hard it is to do, because you don't see that very often as a female. Like, she's the lead, and to me, and she, I love that, and it's her, it's her story, but he still is, is, you know, the leader on the battlefield, and, and he's such a very strong, he's not underwritten, and so, you know, how hard is that, how difficult is that? Are there fights in the room over, you know, who's, like, like you said in the, the one sex scene, you know, like, like yes, no, this should be him saying it. Which, did one of you guys write that episode where she mentioned that? To, you want to start there? Well, again, first of all, I'd say it's the books. I mean, Claire is a very strong character, so um, no, not so much. I honestly think sometimes, my concern is sometimes she's so strong that she seems bossy, and you know what I mean? So I was trying to kind of navigate that so he doesn't um, look like just kind of a dope. Um, but but he, I, I don't think we do that. But I, And the nice thing is they both have areas of expertise where they're strong. Um, so yeah, no, I like that about it too. I think the difficult thing for me in, in writing Jamie is 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 that sometimes in the book he's he's kind of a Superman, and um, it's it's tough to write Superman as, as you'll watch the Superman movies. They, they can't do anything to the guy. He's just, oh, and, and Jamie feels like sometimes it, it, we we get to that stage. I know Ron and I. There's there's something coming up that Ron and I were. Uh, adamantly against, and and, and uh, other people in the room were four, and there was a big argument, and we lost, and they won. And, uh, not that we keep score. Not that we. Not that we. we here is where we keep score. It, it, it was. It was like, wow, would, would he? Would this happen? Could he do? This? You know, all the things that you think about as as being a man and and wanting to be a decent guy, and but sometimes he's just a little too Superman. -y. And hopefully we throw a few rocks at him, and, and, and uh, you know we bring Claire brings him down to earth a little bit. I think. Tony, did you have anything to add to that? No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, somebody who we haven't had before this gentleman with the glasses on his head. <laughs> so, having to do with these battles between each side. Um, I need some advice on this. I run into, I've, I've written a screenplay that's an adaptation to a book, and I have this split. I have half my crew that wants me to make a huge change in the book, which I want to make, and then the other half is the author of the book doesn't want me to make that change. Have you had that with Diana? What have you done? <laughs> you know, the, 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 the honest, undramatic answer is that Diana has been really supportive and has never really fought any change that we've made. She has been incredibly generous with the material and from the first meeting I had with her she said, I don't do what you do, 
I have to trust what you're going to do, and whatever you want to do is always going to be okay with me. I, I may give you my opinion, but it's always your call. And that is not always the case. I mean, you know, when you approach an adaptation, like you're finding out, your nightmare is that the author is going to be a nightmare. But Diana was is just not built that way, and uh, we have a really good relationship with her. And I found that when I approached her initially, I said to her, look, I want to do the best adaptation of your work that we can. I'm going to try to be as faithful to it as we can. Changes are inevitable because of the translation from one medium to another. And I'll always tell you why, why we're doing it. And she accepted that. And we've had a very easy good relationship on that front. You know, if she doesn't like something, she's not shy. <laughs> so, you know, she will say, look, I, I disagree with this, but at the end of every conversation is, but it's your call. You know, and she respects that. And I've never had her second guess it. I've never had her say, I told you not to do that or any of that. She just, she buys it. She buys into it. And it's like a salute to her, you know, as, as a person. And, and she didn't have to be that way because she spent 20 some odd years of her life working on this stuff and I'm just some clown who showed up and turning it into a TV show. But it's been a very easy relationship with her. Uh, I don't know that I have advice to give you in terms of that. It's like, except that ultimately, if you're the guy and this is your show or your movie or whatever it is that you're adapting, you got to like go through your best make version that you can. Is no one is later going to give you credit for the fact, well, it sucked, but you know, at least they were faithful to the book. <laughs> no one's going to say that. It's going to be judged on its own, and people are going to make their calls about whether they enjoyed this hour or two hours of viewing or not, and you have to sort of be comfortable in yourself that you made the best creative call that you could at that time and in that moment and stand by it, and whether or not people you know, would throw money at you or not. Well, um, I think that's a great way to wrap up. We're actually out of time tonight. Um, I just want to really, really thank all of our wonderful Outlander writers. Thanks for watching, everyone. We're out to work whiskey now, so thank you very much, you guys. Ha, ha, ha.